So if you haven't figured it out by now, I am pretty passionate about history and history education. And part of that passion uh, involves me going out and trying to find people that I can learn from and uh, who can help me grow and uh, really who are just basically smarter than I am. Uh, well, one of those guys is Ed Ayers. I got to have a conversation with Ed. This man is absolutely phenomenal and his resume is just completely ridiculous. I can't even get into all of it. Uh, in short, he's been in higher education for 40 years. Uh, he's an author and a historian, uh, was a finalist for the National Book Award, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in History, and was given the National Humanities Award from the President of the United States of America. Uh, so I was super, super excited to talk to Ed. We had all kinds of interesting things that, that we discussed. Currently, Ed is involved in some projects that are really exciting, and we're going to talk about them in our conversation. One of them is something called New American History, which is just this huge pool of educational resources for history, um, including something called American Panorama, which you have to go look at. It, it is genius. Uh, and another one is called The Future of America's Past, which is just a, a brilliantly shot and executed production on different historical places. I'm going to put links to these in the description so that you can go check them out for yourself and uh, I, I don't say this lightly they they are truly great uh, anyway enough of me blabbing here's a conversation with Ed Ayers all right um, so I, I guess kind of before I launch into any of my other questions um, I know how, how long have you been like uh, in the in the college world uh, 40 years. 40 years? Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm trying to, think, trying to edit it down. It, it was a weird time. So I, I went to graduate school in 1975. Okay. Uh, from Tennessee up to Yale. Uh, newly married at 22 in typical East Tennessee style. But our kids find this impossible to believe that people would get married at 21. <laughs> And uh, so I was in graduate school from 75 till 80. And then in 80, I lucked out and got the job at UVA, which I had for 27 years. And then I kind of went to the ranks and became Dean of Arts and Sciences at UVA. And then Richmond offered me the presidency in 2007. So I did that for eight years. Okay. And now I'm thinking about the stuff that you're thinking about uh, full time, <laughs> what I'm doing now. So All right. I've been doing, I, my first book is in 84 which is an alarming concept. But so that's how long I've been. If you figure that it took me a while to write that. <laughs> 40 years. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you to kind of dig into the vault here. Um, All right. <laughs> what, uh, what, what was history class like for uh, a 15 year old Ed Ayers? Oh God, it was, it was just terrible. <laughs> you know, I couldn't have cared less and it really was, uh, and no stereotypes involved, but it really was a football coach reading the textbook to us yeah. and, uh, and then giving some kind of test. And so I just didn't care. I could do it because I could read pretty well, you know, so I could do that. But I found nothing engaging about it. I, if you told me I was going to be studying dead people for a living when I was 15, I wouldn't believe it. <laughs> uh, but I was very interested in writing in literature, I was editor of the student newspaper, the Cougar Paw Print. Okay. Uh, perhaps you've heard of it. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to look that up. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, sports, I'm a sports writer and editor. And uh, so I, I, it, it wasn't school that got me interested in history. And uh, it wasn't actually knowing it. I lived in a very interesting place. I uh, lived uh, in Upper East Tennessee, which was Unionist during the Civil War, which was right next to the Great War Path, which was 20 miles from where country music was first recorded and all this. And I was completely oblivious to all of it. <laughs> you know? And so, uh, but I did have a clear sense that, uh, you know, we lived somewhere unusual. We, we would go places and people would ask us where we were from and what kind of accent this was and all. And uh, say East Tennessee, and they'd look to see if we had shoes on, you, you know. <laughs> So, uh, but what made the big impact on me was visiting my grandparents who lived way up in the mountains of North Carolina, um, an hour, 15 minutes away. 
uh, in a house that had been built back in the 1830s uh, that where my grandmother had been born in 1897. Oh, wow. uh, they didn't have a telephone until I was 15 years old, the year you've asked me about. <laughs> and I would go visit them and sp spend months with my grandmother while my grandfather was gone doing construction some different places. Okay. And I could, she'd go out and slaughter the pig. And, and it's like, okay, well, something's happened between <laughs> her life and mine <laughs> and I came to understand that was history I didn't know what that was so yeah. that's kind of a long answer to what what my, what I was like sitting in class when I was 15. <laughs> well the, the reason I ask is um a lot of times I'll, I'll run into people and um you know you start talking about history or really when it comes up is when you talk about museums stuff like that and uh some people have a pretty strong opinion about history. Like, Oh, I, I hate history. And a lot of times w within five minutes and a few questions uh, that, that can usually be traced back to, they hated their history class that, that right. history was boring to them. On the other hand, I teach freshmen at the university of Richmond, a class called touching the past. And it's basically every year, a, sort of an experiment, what the kids coming out of high school all across the country uh -huh. know about history. And when I ask them why they're in the class, they always have two reasons. One, they went somewhere really interesting when they were a kid, yeah. or two, they had a great history teacher. So we don't want to lose the flip side of that, just right. as often, right? It was a teacher who revealed to them that all this past that was otherwise invisible was in fact really interesting. And I think the takeaway is a lot depends on what happens in history class. Yeah, I, I guess that kind of leads to another question. Um, what, what do you think makes a, an effective history teacher? Like, what, what do you think is the common factor that's like grabbing those people and really getting them interested early on? Caring about what you're teaching is the most important thing, right? And real, it, it's like, I describe it to kids like, I'm giving you night vision, okay? Once you can begin to see in time, right? You, you can actually sort of see through the present into mm. the things that got us here, right? Uh, or you can see in another dimension. You know, you've been just looking at life on the front page and now you can do three dimensions. Once you glimpse that, and I don't think it really matters what the particular subject is and what your particular uh, path into caring about it is, the fact that you care about it, I think is the important thing. And that's my concern right now is that things aren't built to make kids care about it they care about getting the right AP score or whatever, uh, but they're not yeah. given a passion for it. Right. I, I think that a lot of people, you know, kids, adults, anybody, they, they like history. They, they just don't know it. Yeah. They don't like the subject of history, Yeah. but they like knowing about everything that happened before today, which is all history is, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I point out they love it when it's Call of Duty in a video game, right? Yeah. They love it when it's, uh, you know, drunk history. Yeah. They love it when it's a, a movie about World War I. It, that just doesn't come labeled as history. Yeah. And so what I want to do is steal some of that mojo for history class, right? Well, uh, I, I want to take advantage of that. In, everybody has to be interested in history. They yeah. just don't know it. Yeah. Well, that's uh, one, one question I'll ask, you know, people, uh, you know, or, or students or whatever will say, you know, they're not really into history. And uh, I'll start naming off movies. Hey, have you seen Saving Private Ryan? Or have you seen, uh, you know, The Patriot or Lincoln, you know, whatever. And they're like, oh, yeah, I love that movie. That, that's a history movie. Uh, you know, those are based on historic events. And a lot of movies that they've seen that are based on history, they don't even know we're based on a historical event. They just think it's entertainment. I was like, well, history's entertaining. If it wasn't entertaining, Hollywood wouldn't be making movies about it. That's a good line that I shall steal. Thank <laughs> you. I like that. Yeah, because uh, the point that I make to him is, you know, yeah, everybody, you know, directors and actors and everybody, you know, they're, they're about their art and, and creating something good. The end of the day, if that movie doesn't make money or doesn't have the, the hope of making money, they're not going to make that movie. Um, right. If it's not going to entertain people. Um, so I think there's a, a huge audience out there who wants to see a movie about Lincoln. Oh, right? absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. That was filmed in Richmond and my wife and I went down there one weekend to see it while it was being filmed. Oh, and, wow. uh, 
they actually turned uh, the state capital, which oh. then ended up being the capital of the Confederacy, yeah. uh, into the White House. One side of it was the White House. And I don't want to disillusion anybody, but the columns of the White House were made out of styrofoam. <laughs> It was amazing. And so, you know, it's when he's actually talking to Kepley, you know, the, the seamstress in the White House, you know, it's oh. filmed there, these fake columns, you know. And uh, so my only beef for that movie was, you know, they, it, I, I think that directors think they have to juice it up in some way or they're not really performing the part. But instead of those two black soldiers listening to Lincoln, under the stage, if he'd actually just talked to Frederick Douglass, yeah. <laughs> as he actually did, it would have been a lot more powerful. So you don't know why they make those choices. But yeah, you're exactly right. I, I just don't think, and that's the whole idea of what I'm trying to do with Buck and these other projects that we maybe will talk about, is to show people that history is not just what you think it is. It's everything. Everything. As, as the American Historical Association, Jim Grossman says, everything has a past. Everything has a history. Yeah. So. So the good news is that if we could just find that cable <laughs> and have kids, you know, grab hold of it, history will do a lot of the work for us, right? Yeah. You know, it's not that I, you know, I, so a lot of us who do this can't really imagine doing science. Uh, you're, you're, uh, you're different in that regard, I know, but it's just like a, an alien world that you kind of get or you don't. But who couldn't get humans like us, confronting situations like us. So that, that's a great advantage. Just a, there's a low threshold, um, and uh, we should step over it more. So you, you mentioned new American history. Um, I've, I've been digging into that that quite a bit, but but you'll be able to explain it better than me. What what exactly is is new American history? Well, so when I was teaching this class for freshmen at University of Richmond, and I would ask them to go out and look for various things to do research. And they, they came back and it turned out if it's not online, it doesn't exist, right? <laughs> the, the online digital electronic world is history. Yeah. And so, and I realized that relative to what we were just talking about, that the world is filled with what I call ambient history. You know, we're you know, every op-ed, every political slogan, you know, history is everywhere. All this yeah. entertainment we're talking about, but you can't see it as such. So the first idea I had was bunk, which is named after the Henry Ford quote, to history's more or less bunk. You know, it's like, man, look, look at all this. He said, the only history that matters at Tinker's Dam is the history we made today. And I point out, yes, we are making history every day. And what bunk does is makes it visible and manipulable so you can connect it all up. The other thing that I've done is uh, American Panorama, uh, a digital atlas of American history, uh, because and my dream there is for every school kid in America to be able to see herself in American history, right? Yeah. So it's the foreign born population in every county from 1850 to the present, right? It's the forced migration, it's the Oregon Trail, it's the Erie Canal, you know, it's redlining. And in all these ways, we make them really big so that everybody can see themselves in it. I think that kids often feel like history is about somebody else, mm -hmm. right? And they don't realize that they're in it. And then I, for the last 12 years, we've had the podcast Backstory. Yes. Uh, which is, uh, you know, every week, 12 years, <laughs> uh, for an hour, uh, you know, trying to have people see history in new ways. And then the new TV show uh, that I'm the host for, The Future of America's Past, uh, celebrating the people who are on the front lines, as we say, of history, interpreting it every day. So visit these places and talk to the park rangers or a genealogist or just volunteers or who are keeping a lot of this memory. So those have different things. They're different. Those are all different media. Right? Right. If you like video, you like audio, you like maps, you like text. Okay, you'll find yourself, but it all connects. So basically what it is is a way to make history presence in our lives visible in ways that we can manage it. We don't just sort of, so you want to go see Saving Private Ryan, you can look it up on Bunk, and then there'll be all articles that will connect to other things that happened in the war in France and so forth, and you lead one thing to another. It's basically, all of this is a big con job trying to trick people into being interested in history who don't <laughs> think they are. And, you know, so 
you, you, we've made it as beautiful as possible. My saying it is we try to make something that looks good enough to be commercial, but it's not. Right. Uh, I'm able to do this because when I finished at Richmond as president, the trustee said, we'd like to acknowledge you. What could we do? And I said, well, what I wish is that I had an endowment that I could use to make innovations in American history. Awesome. And to be an ally with teachers and students. And uh, so they, they did that. So that's how I'm able to do this. I don't have to go out and get a grant every year and so forth. And so I have two great allies, Tony Field, who runs Bump, and Annie Evans, who's a very experienced social studies coordinator yeah. uh, in Virginia, to do all the education. Because I've been a college professor for 40 years, but I don't know how to teach high school. Right? Okay. I've worked with lots of high school teachers, with Gilderoy Lehrman and so forth. Yep. Uh, they've been inflicted on you, I understand. Yes. Uh, but, uh, and, and doing that just makes me respect that you guys have f- sort of full contact sport, whereas <laughs> we're just talking, right? You, I mean, really, you have a chance to be a presence in these kids' lives in ways that college professors just don't. So I thought, well, what do I really care about now that I've done, you know, two jobs and, and I'm going down the stretch here? What really matters? And what really matters is helping teachers and, and doing public history. So I'm on seven boards uh, of, of museums and things because that's the other place where we touch the past. So, you know, I was late to understand how history was interesting. And I'm trying to make up for lost time by you know, getting that 15-year-old kid that you were mentioning at the beginning to give her a chance to see, oh, wow, there's a lot more here than I realized. I, I've spent a decent amount of time on the the New American History uh, website, and it's it's good. I mean, I know that you're saying that it's designed for, like, high school age, or that's, that's kind of like your target. Um, but I, I would say anybody that, that likes history, uh, like the, the American panorama. So I'm, I'm a maps guy. I like maps. I like charts. I like, you know, everything kind of clustered together to, to where you can get a visual of it. Um, the, the bad thing about American panorama is you can burn hours <laughs> on that thing. I mean, you can lose a lot of time <laughs> uh, just yeah. being immersed in it. It, I, it really is it a, just, a genius. Is and I don't make any of those. It was my idea. Uh, to make this digital atlas of American history. And I did get a grant uh, from the Mellon Foundation to help fund it. But uh, Rob Nelson and Justin Madrin and Nathaniel Ayers all know actually how to make all, and they invented all these ways of doing it. And they really are beautiful. So it, it's, it is phenomenal. Um, yeah, well, it, it's, it's really hard to even describe it, honestly. Uh, people just have to kind of go to it and dive in. I'll, I'll put some links in the description of this video where people can go right to it because it, it, it really is amazing work. Well, thank you. You know, Annie Evans has a learning resource about how to use the foreign-born population in your classroom, right? Mm-hmm. And so that people, because we don't, we know you don't have infinite amounts of time. You're right that it does. All, but all those projects basically consume days of your life if you let them, right? Yeah. <laughs> but sometimes you just want to come in and say, hey, kids, I've got three minutes. Let me show you the pattern of it, say, wait, Let's look at what immigration looked like in the North and the South in 1860. And you call up foreign born, and there it is, right? Or you can say, I want to, let's talk about, people talk about the Overland Trails. What, what did that actually look like, right? Or you can say, you got three days. I want you to come in and really explore this, write a paper on it. So this is part of what I understood from teaching, working with history teachers, is that you teach lots of different classes. Yeah. You know, time is short. Uh, you got to cover a lot of things. <laughs> so we tried to make tools that you can use for either a minute or an hour or a week, right? Because the whole point of all this is to we trust teachers, trying to give you something good enough that you know, and you'll know how to use it, right? right? So Annie gives us some tips about ways to streamline that process because you don't have hours to go poke around at all. Uh, but uh, I do think, and I'm excited because I have a book coming out this fall based on 80 full color maps uh, that my friends at uh, uh, Digital Scholarship Lab made. It's called Southern Journey, The Migrations of the American South, 1790 to 2020. Really? And we just made the last map 
which is of the COVID crisis the virus. Uh, and so you can actually see how it, it follows the path of the domestic slave trade. Really? Yeah. So you can just sort of see the path of all this. So, but yeah, uh, these were lectures at LSU, uh, Fleming lectures, which is usually a small book. And I said, Hey, how about 84 color maps? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, okay. And I went to my friends and said, hey, how about 80 full color original maps? But they show black po population movement, white population movement, native population movement, and immigrant movement in ways that we've never seen before. And they made the beautiful maps, and I wrote some words about it. You can decide which of that's more interesting. Uh, but anyway, so that's coming out in, in the fall. And the whole idea is to show how we can use maps to actually not just illustrate history, but to change the story we tell about the past. So the Great Migration, for example, looks nothing like it does in our textbooks with a big red arrow going up the Mississippi River, <laughs> right? <laughs> Instead, it's this multi-nucleated thing where people come from different places and different parts of the South at different times and different cities, and, and more white people are leaving than black, which most people don't know, right? At the same time, things like that. So I'm hoping it'll be a way to really show how maps can be used for a lot more than we've imagined. That's really exciting. Uh, right. I'm kind of pumped about that. Uh, All right, we're good. Yeah. Southern Journey is the title, LSU Press, uh, November. It's called Southern Journey? Yeah. Okay. All right, yeah. I'll definitely be looking. And it's going to be out in the fall. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. Hey, uh, let me switch gears here a little bit. Right. Um, so you've been in, in the college world for... You said 40 years. We've established that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just be clear. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go to sleep here soon. If you just, <laughs> um, I, I was on a, um, oh, it was like a history education group not too long ago, uh, and and it was geared towards high school teachers, and uh, somebody on there was was asking about um, textbooks or what they use and stuff like that. And textbooks, of course, are are dry. I, I don't think that people should just use a textbook. I think that's an awful way to teach history. Um, I think it should be a a guide that you kind of yeah. build on. Um, but I, I noticed a, a lot of people um, mentioning Howard Zinn's uh, A People's History of the United States, which uh, generated quite a bit of controversy um, just because, I mean, he... That's what it's built to do. Yeah. It's really controversial. Right? Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, he 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 said that you know he he admits up front that that this is a biased look at at history. It's it's a different take. Um, and I, I was just kind of curious. I know that that colleges get a, a little bit of a oh I don't want to say a bad rap, but but they they do get gigged for having bias. Yeah. One way, one way or the other. And I, I was kind of curious. Oh, really just one way. Do what? <laughs> You're being polite, but but all the bias people assume it's toward liberalism, you know. So, so I, I was kind of curious, just your your thoughts on that. Like, whenever teaching history, regardless if it's centrist, left wing, right wing, everybody's got their own perspective on on life and on politics and on history. Um, is there a way to teach history in an unbiased way or, or, or should we just, Hey, say upfront, I'm conservative, I'm liberal, I'm centrist. Um, and then, and then filter it through that. I, I don't know. I was just kind of curious what your thoughts were on that. Yeah. You know, the important thing is evidence. Okay. Uh -huh. You know, so, you know, I made this thing, uh, oversaw this project starting back in the early 1990s called the Valley of the Shadow, which yeah. is every piece of information about every person who lived in a northern community and a southern community through the entire era of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Basically insane, but we didn't know it in 1991 <laughs> that it was going to be that hard. It took us 14 years to build, but it's been used millions of times. And there the idea is, is that find me a piece of evidence in here that's not biased. And there's yeah. nothing, okay, right? Now, it's interesting. I, I noticed that kids coming out of high school often talk about bias when we're in this freshman class. Okay. College professors never talk about bias. Right. Right. We just assume that everything is situated in its time, right? Including ourselves. So if I, and most college professors I know 
a matter of fact, I think almost all, including people on the left, don't uh, don't like Howard Zinn's book because okay. it doesn't. You know, it just takes the usual story and turns it upside down. Right? It's not really um, engaging with the hard questions in many ways to to find out. You know, there, these people are villains. Well, that doesn't explain anything, right? <laughs> so I think that if there are topics that and I taught the second half of the U.S. survey for a long time at the University of Virginia. Okay. You know, all these kids who are actually coming out of AP, uh, then often if they were going to be history education, they needed to take the U.S. survey too. And so I would, it was almost 500 people, right? And so I would come there and try to explain the New Deal in 70 minutes, <laughs> things like that, right? <laughs> and uh, of course, you know, anybody who starts a survey, that's what you have to do, right? Yeah. I got one semester to cover everything from Reconstruction to, you know, at that time, you know, the Clinton administration or whatever. And uh, I never felt I needed to say that I was liberal or conservative because if I'm teaching it right, it doesn't matter. You know, if you listen to backstory, there's a place we're playing with fire every week. Yeah. Right. We're, we're and we, but very seldom have we been called up for political bias because what we can do is we can imagine what does a, a, a conservative criticism of this liberal position sound like, right? Or what does a liberal criticism of this conservative position sound like. And our job as historians and as teachers is to take out any personal investment in that and show kids, look, there's this evidence about the past, okay? Let's talk about what does it show us. And what you think about today is not really, uh, doesn't prevent you from seeing the patterns of the evidence clearly. So. Even though I've taught, and, and other things I teach are history of the South and slavery and civil yeah. war, you know, and all this public history I did, I was the founding chair, board chair of the American Civil War Museum. So I've been playing with fire for a long time now, right? And I think that people just respect honesty, you yeah. know? And, and I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm just telling you what this is what it looks like. I was on the uh, commission to consider the Confederate statues on Monument Avenue in Richmond. Okay. And, and so our job was to go out and have lots of public hearings and things, right? I'm, I'm sure and, that was not, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, inflammatory or dynamic? Or, well, you know. it, it wasn't because, you know, people would try to make it that way. But so they'd say, well, Dr. Ayers, what do you think? And I'd say, listen, I'm just a public servant right now. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you what I think, but here's what I will do. I will argue with whatever you think. What you got? Right. That's, and that's A, amazing. it was fun. But B, it was because I could just, I could blast them, you know. And I would hear things, you know, in one conversation that I could then use and find out what would be most effective later on. Right. But I don't think people, you know, I didn't come out of there saying something should come down or not. You know, I did say we should understand where these statutes came from. You know, that was my position. That's right? reasonable. And, and uh, so I think I, I really do believe that if you come into it with a pure heart, <laughs> right? And, you know, Howard Zinn was trying to sell something, a perspective, right? But if we're just honest teachers and helping kids understand, well, here's why somebody would believe that, you know? Here's why somebody would be skeptical of the coronavirus lockdown. Here's somebody why I think it's selfish to go out without them. You know, that's our opportunity is to see things in 360 degrees so that the kids realize that everything is not divided up in two screens on a television set with people yelling at each other, right? Yeah. So if we can't find ways to get, to transcend whatever political belief we may have, we're not doing it right. That's what I think. My, my, my goal, uh, whenever I've taught any class, um, is, is to be able to make it to the end of the day or the end of the semester without you really knowing how I yeah. feel. Uh, yeah. but, but I do want you to know, kind of like what you were just saying, I, I do want you to know how everybody else in that era felt. Yeah. Um, well, that's, you know, one reason I did the whole, you know, the value shadow in two books based on it of North and South, right? Yeah. And we would basically, as you read them, you go, one step at a time, here's what it looked like from the north, then here's what it looked like from the south. And you can just sort of see. And so there's a case, you know, where um, people want to 
they, 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 even for good purposes, will trivialize the past by trying to hurry up and put somebody in a box. Yeah. And I would say it's been kind of the point of my writing is to say, well, in the South in particular, it's more complicated than you think, folks, right? You know, it's clear who the good people were and who the bad people were, right? But, you know, how did people explain this to themselves? I think that's often a good way to begin. How did people at the time explain this to themselves, why it was right to dispossess the American Indians? What was the rationale for, you know, going to war to defend slavery, right? And unless we sort of set aside whatever political belief we have to enter into that, we're never going to be able to teach history. Yeah. Um, I can already see it in the comment section now, what you just said. I'm going to have so many people say, the Civil War wasn't fought over slavery. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, I, I was, you know, I've written about this. I, I wrote a two, I wrote a little book called "What Caused the Civil War," uh -huh. and uh, the answer is, well, if you just say slavery, which of course is the knee-jerk thing, yeah. and you don't. Well, was it really? And what I say here's the equation. This is the answer to that. It's an unbalanced equation. The South did go to war to protect slavery, but the North did not go to war to end it. Right. That's the right answer. <laughs> and, 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 change. And, and so it, I, it, something I point out is that anybody who tries to fit history on a bumper sticker is already lost. Yeah. And the flip side of this, too, is that very often in, back to the Confederate monument situation, people would say, well, Robert E. Lee was a fine Christian gentleman or Stonewall Jackson. And I would say, yeah, but what would have happened if they'd won? Yeah. And you, go, you see people, oh, would have dismembered the United States. <laughs> yeah. And I think that people begin to see that. So I think we, especially on the Civil War, we think in formulas, right? We have the quick answers on both sides, and we got to dissolve them, which is kind of scary. <laughs> yeah. And look at each moment. <laughs> That's, um, you, you said that about Robert E. Lee and people saying that he was a fine Christian guy and everything. I, I'll uh, usually agree with them and say, yeah, yeah, he, he was. Um, that just shows that even good people, can get caught up in some, in some bad ideas uh, if you're not careful of, you know, and, you know, a lot of people, hey, maybe in, in, in that era, in those, in that time period, you'd make the same decisions. Um, Apparently millions of people did. Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that's one of the, you know, I'm a little unusual being a white Southerner in higher end uh, at this level, you know, it's kind of, and I've noticed I've been in two series on uh, Reconstruction on television, and both of them, they have me explain why anybody would vote for Andrew Johnson. I actually, I went to Andrew Johnson Elementary School in East Tennessee. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, and, I, I, you know, there's a case where he just dismissed as a racist or a hillbilly or whatever. And I said, well, on the other hand, he was the only United States senator who didn't secede. Yeah, he's got, he's got a lot of courage in some ways. So let's you know, let's don't kind of pigeonhole people so much. And all of this, you know, I think that that's kids are looking for quick formulas to explain away, and not just kids, right. people in the outside world. Yeah, our job is to resist the formulas and put people's humanity at front stage. Uh, I I think that's exactly right. And what I tell people is, um, history is is complex because it's made up of people. And, and people are complex. Yeah. Um, but I, I want to hit something else. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier. Um, You're just trying to see how much trouble you can get me into. I see. I, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Next, I'm going to ask you uh, if, if we would have won at Gettysburg if uh, Stonewall okay. Jackson would have been there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you, you mentioned the future of America's past, uh, which is um, a series of shows the, that you've been the, the host of that have been on PBS and uh, are available online. And oh my gosh, they are good. Um, I haven't, there's, there's a few of them that I haven't seen yet. Uh, but tell me, what was the, the genesis of that project? Yeah, thank you. They are really great because all I do is show up and talk to people. Right? <laughs> I'm very proud. I don't know if you noticed that the director and producer are my daughter uh, and her husband. Uh, Hannah Ayers and Lance Warren, and one of the people who makes the maps you like for American Panorama is my son, Nathaniel Ayers. Okay, so, I heard that name mentioned earlier, yeah, and I wonder yeah, if, if, if I were a business, I'd be, I, you know, I'd be 
in, in business, but instead we're all <laughs> not profit world. Um, and so um, they are independent filmmakers based in Richmond. And uh, Lance used to work for Gilder Lehrman when they were in New York. And, and they decided what they really wanted to do was tell stories uh, about the intersection of history and social justice. Okay. And, you know, I've been sort of working on that for a long time. So there's uh, Virginia Public Media, the PBS in, in Virginia, uh, wanted to do something about history. And they, they knew me and they knew them because they made a wonderful film that I want people to know about called An Outrage that you can download. That they made on their own, with their own money, that involved traveling from Virginia to Texas and talking to people who were keeping the memory of lynching, a, a particular lynching alive. Really? And it's just as beautiful as can be. And it's, you know, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center has picked it up and distributed it and put together a teaching guide. So if you, if you find yourself having to teach about one of the most hard, difficult subjects there is, lynching and outrage. And so Hannah and Lance have shown it dozens and dozens of times. I don't know how they do it because they go around and people are crying by the end of this. And then they have to talk about it. So we, we thought, okay, if we could do anything, what would it be? You know, if you could do anything about history, right? Um, and there's something powerful about a landscape of going to the place where things actually happen, right? Yeah, exactly. And there's something powerful about people who are not just, frankly, talking heads like me who write books, but who are there every day explaining, you know, Robert E. Lee at Gettysburg, right? Yeah. You know, there's somebody at Gettysburg who has to answer this question <laughs> every day, right? And so we put together, and Lance and Hannah really envisioned it and sort of leverage the fact that, you know, having done this for 40 years, I can talk with most people about what they're doing in American history. So we made the first episode about Fort Monroe where the first African people arrived in 1619, then about where emancipation began. Then we went to New York City for the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, which is it's a particularly powerful one, by the way. Yeah. And in each of those, we're talking to descendants of people, we're talking to artists, you know, at Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, I, I went to the apartment of a woman who'd won the Pulitzer Prize. She'd written an oratorio with the voices of a hundred girls that was performed at Carnegie Hall about the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. It is, you know, and a part of the chorus is just the names of these girls, some of which are Italian and some of which are Jewish, you know. And wow. Then we went to uh, Transcontinental Railroad and I talked, you know, with uh, uh, descendants of the American Indian people who were there when the railroad came through and who are still there. Yes. Uh, and so, but another powerful one, Japanese American incarceration, actually go to Manzanar. It was so freaking cold. <laughs> uh, and talk to a young woman, a park historian who explains this. And, but then talk to, on the Transcontinental Road, talk to a descendant of one of the Chinese laborers. Yeah. You know? And so the whole idea is to make people care about history, but, as you notice, they're, they're beautifully shot. We have an Emmy-nominated uh, cinematographer, a composer. The graphic motion is all great. So we're trying to find sort of a new vocabulary that's not, you know, everybody associates this with Ken Burns' great accomplishments. We're trying to do something different, uh, right? You know, where it's uh, history in place um, as an ongoing struggle and drama. So we're, we should be shooting the third season right now, but we're not because of the virus, but we hope to be, we are making one. I want people to stay alert to that. I'm doing the voiceover this afternoon. It'll be um, streaming online. We hope on NPR uh -huh. about the Spanish flu in Richmond in 1918, oh. which is exactly like, and we found, we, Hannah found 1917 film footage of Richmond. If you can imagine this, right? Oh, and, so, and so what we found is that, there were masks, there were social distancing, there were hospitals, but then they opened up the stores and a huge another wave came through. Yep. Right. So it's like, and a lot more people died then than it seems will die now. Yeah. So we're trying to make, it's kind of like backstory in the sense that we're trying to say the way the history connects, but we're also celebrating. So all these are hard stories, but, they're not the, but the episodes themselves aren't sad. Right. Because you can see that people, like historians, like history teachers, right? We, write, we think about hard things. I describe myself as a cheerful guy who gets up and thinks about the worst things in American history every day for a living. Right? 
<laughs> because we have to, right? Yeah. And if we're going to move on. So these shows are beautiful uh, celebrations, uh, trying to get people to think about the past and maybe more color and more motion <laughs> than they had before. So that's where it came from. So we hope we'll make more. It'd be great if people, and you'll notice on New American History, Annie has made learning resources, but the new one that just came out yesterday, mm -hmm. made learning resources about one of our best shows, which is about Farmville in 1951 and Barbara Johns and uh, the strike that fed into Brown v. Board. Oh, wow. And we a visit there. And Annie's made the and wonderful, taking segments from the show, you show in class, and then pause, and then the questions that you can ask about it and so forth. So we're trying to connect all, and then you go to a map on that same resource, and you can see redlining uh, and how it was that uh, cities in Richmond, Norfolk, nearby, uh, built segregation in. So why these schools would be so poor, right? And then you go to Bunk, and it's also got a whole segment on school segregation. So you can see how the tea, all these different, and, and backstory, the whole thing about uh, segregation. So the whole idea is that each of these things has a power. You know, the video with the beautiful presentation of it uh, is, can do something that audio can't. But audio can do something in your imagination that video can't. So that's what we're trying to do. But over the next year, uh, we hope to have a whole series of suites like that. So if you need to teach this subject, here's a whole different set of resources that you can use. And we're trying to make it about all the big topics in American history, right? So that if you right. need to talk about World War II and the home front, here are things that you can do, you could have. So that's what we're trying to do. But uh, you'll notice a pattern in all these. I find people who are smarter than I am and attach myself to them. That, right? that's, why, that's why I'm talking to you right now, because I, <laughs> yeah. I, I try to find people that are smarter than me. Yeah, you can't do that. I've already played that card. But. <laughs> so, but, you know, I don't know how to make these maps. I don't know how to make these TV shows. I don't know how to make the podcast. I don't know the uh, understand all the taggy behind Bunk. But I just imagine what I wish I had and that I can mobilize uh, people, find great allies to help make it. So that's, yeah. that's the secret. It's, it's really good. Um, I've, I've, I've enjoyed all of it. Um, the, I, okay. I'm, I'm going to get you in trouble again here. Um, so on, on the episode with transcontinental, uh, yeah. where you, you talk to, you know, descendants of, uh, you know, the native Americans that got displaced and, and the, um, Chinese immigrants that worked on the, the railroad and everything. Here's one thing that I was thinking as I was watching that. Yeah. So, okay. You, you have the, the Chinese immigrants who come to the United States and work their butts off under horrible conditions and really uh, accomplish this great thing that is, is like the internet of the 1800s. It, it connects the yeah. United States like never before. At the same time, <laughs> it displaces a bunch of native Americans um, so are the Chinese immigrants, the heroes or the villains of that story? Yeah, they're not in charge of policy. <laughs> they're just trying. To, so, yeah. I mean, are, are there villains? I mean, you know, we, we talked to the, the park historian who, you know, shows that the railroads themselves were clearing land. They never actually intended to put rails down because they got paid by the acre or something yes. like that. You know, it's the usual, you know, <laughs> people with money. <laughs> <laughs> But they're doing, but as you said, you know, they're connecting the country and they're exploiting the situation. If they hadn't done it, it wouldn't have been done on one hand, right? Uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I thought that was one of the great gifts of Darren, who I spoke with uh, from the Shoshone people, mm -hmm. of recognizing, it goes back to what we were saying before, it's not so much about individual blame on all this. It's like, I want people to know that we're still here. Yeah. Right. But, and I, I think in the same way, you know, one of the most powerful moments for me is on the Japanese American incarceration. I interviewed a woman who I think is 93 in her apartment in Los oh, Angeles. Yeah. Who had been the songbird of Manzanar, right? When she was 16 years old. And she refused to, hold, to blame individuals. You know, yeah. she just said, 
we survived. It's more about us and our survival rather than who was wrong, right? Yes. So I think that, I, I will be honest, in most of what I write, I try not to just look for the easy blame, yeah. you know? And because it, that's, a, that's a, a short circuit's actually thinking about it. Yeah. Because, you know, not to get too sappy, but, you know, we're all implicated, we're complicit in all kinds of things that are wrong. You know, even if we're just sitting here alone in our house, right? <laughs> there are things that, you know, you go to the grocery store and you see some homeless person and you know, we know 50 years from now, people will look back and be appalled that we have tolerated that, right? Yeah. But sometimes I'll give him some money, sometimes I won't, but do I do anything to really fix it, right? So I think we all need to get over ourselves, right? <laughs> and, and history is a good way of doing that yeah. and trying to imagine. What was the story the guys building the railroad would have told themselves? That we're building progress, we're creating jobs for these Chinese guys, you know, that the Shoshone are, you know, they wouldn't have done anything with this land anyway. These Irish laborers, you know, uh, I mean, a lot of it is, I mean, is really insulting to other humans, so it's, I'm not defending it, but if we don't understand that everybody has a story for why they're doing what they're doing. Right. <laughs> the trick to history is to figure out what that is, right? <laughs> and every once in a while we'll realize what's the story for what I'm doing. Yeah. Right? Uh, I think the main lesson from history is humility. You know, yeah. is to think about we're all part of things bigger than ourselves. Uh, are we doing the best that we can with the hand that's dealt us? Um, yeah. The answer is almost always no, but <laughs> we, we, we do our best. <laughs> Uh, well, I, w I was secretly hoping that you would answer the question in that manner because, because oh. yeah, it's <laughs> because I, yeah, I completely agree with you that it's, it's never black and white. Um, it, it's, it's, it's always, it's always complex. Um, yeah. And the trick there is since you agree with me, I'll do a typical teacher thing and disagree with you. Right. Just to, <laughs> say, the trick is, and I, I really had to wrestle with this a lot in the civil war stuff. Uh, I wrote an essay called Worrying About the Civil War. And I wrote it in the early 90s um, when Ken Burns and James McPherson's Battle Cry of Freedom were all the rage. And yeah. uh, uh, um, what's the novel about gay killer angels, right? Yeah. Everybody loved all this. And I just said, God, it makes me a little worried that we all loved it, right? Because it's, it's all about how great America really was, you know, and, you know, Burns has David McCullough say it's like a teenage adolescent crisis we had to move through. And I said, was it really, <laughs> you know, uh, weren't, weren't, weren't there just terrible mistakes that were made and great costs? And don't we actually need to acknowledge the North didn't go to war to end slavery? And all those things were dangerous to reopen. Yeah. And so the point of it is, in, 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 a colleague of mine one time at a PhD exam, a student said, well, things are complex. And she said, and my colleague said, that's not an explanation. That's an observation. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, it's, I, I, the difference I make is things are not just complex. They're complicated. Right. If something is complicated, you can take it apart and see how it works. Right? Yeah. It's something complex. It's like, yeah, you know, we just kind of throw up our hands. So instead, let's think of a, you know, the uh, exploded chart that you get from Ikea, right? In some ways, we need to be able to take history apart into its constituent elements so kids can actually see how the, that there are all these different pieces, right? So there's the ideology of states' rights. There, there's the power of slavery. You know, okay, those aren't the same thing, but they – they connect in this way. Oh, look, the Northern Democrats are really into this racist thing, right? You know, so tab A and slot B sometimes <laughs> connect in ways that you can't see. So that's the reason, that's for the idea of American Panorama. Huh. Let's put all the pieces there, but we can take them apart and then reassemble them in different ways and see how history actually works. So, and the same thing is true with Bunk. If we have 12 different perspectives, and you can see how they connect. Maybe we get a sense to actually see something in three dimensions. So that's my argument. Things are complicated, not complex. 
can't think of a better way to end it than that. <laughs> yeah, I, I really do appreciate the work that you're doing and uh, and all the contributions that you're making. It's um, I know on my end, it's definitely appreciated um, and it's it's good stuff. Well, let me put in a plug, man. I appreciate that very much. You know, um, we're closer to the beginning of New American history than we are to the end, right? Good. We're really just starting. We've got all of American history to do, and it's big and hard. And with any Evans in particular, please let us know what you would like to see. Please let us know how things could be better. What, what problem do you have teaching that we could maybe help offer a tool that would make it easier? Things like that. that. That's what we think that we're doing is that we're trying to, you know, I'll end with this, you know, so I, I come after, you know, being a professor, then a dean, and then a president. Okay, well, what do you care about now the rest of your life? And I say, you know, every American takes American history. If we can make that 1% better. Yeah. Think what a contribution that would be, yeah, right? Exactly. So that's what we're doing. But what that means is that we need lots of partners and lots of allies. So I hope that you'll tell your friends to, uh, to come join us. Let's see if we can't hit that 1%. Absolutely. All right. That's